Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and launch it now. Uh, we'll hear the music for a little bit, and then I'll, I'll pause it, and we'll jump in, all right? Sounds good. All right, here we go. So because this is just uh, music playing in the background, they're doing a full scale big intro for Samoa Joe. Yes, they are. This is the TNA WrestleMania entrance. <laughs> it is. They got guys coming out twirling fire around. And uh, this is this is the WrestleMania style entrance here for, for, for Joe. So once we get through Joe, maybe we'll see what they do for you. If they shoot you up from the floor or, you know, here comes Joe. Dude, how much of a badass was he? At I mean, he still is, but I mean. You know what? I remember the first night I saw him. We were at a bar when I signed with TNA. And he was in a corner by himself, and he was drinking a scotch. And I looked at his mug, his face, and I was just like, <laughs> nobody's going to fuck with this guy. <laughs> Samoa Joe's a badass for real, man. He's a tough son of a bitch. And he's still getting it done all these years later at just a, and he's still jumping outside of the ring, you know, plancha, all these other moves. He's just so athletic for what he can do with his size and speed and quickness, power. All he is. It. He's so versatile for his size. He's a 300 pound guy. He's six foot one. So he's thick, you know, he's thick around the waist. We know that, but, um, he moves like a cat. The guy's incredible. Here we go. They're showing people around ringside. I'll unmute it when they uh, when they bring you down because I want to see what this see and hear what this looks like. And uh, so let's check this out. And here he comes, Frank Craig. You've gone on record. You made the prediction. You said Kurt Angle will not only retain that title, but he will take Samoa Joe's career and extinguish it tonight. And it's got to feel kind of bad for Kurt because Kurt really doesn't want to have to end a guy's career like that. But Joe's the one that said he said if I lose, I'm going home and I'm going to stay home. Kurt's just doing his job. He wants to keep that belt. This is something he's always strived after, making sure he keeps his belts and keeps his medals. It's another piece he's not going to let go. I think that Kurt Angle would look at it as a major notch in his belt if he's able to end the career of Samoa Joe. He stands six foot one and weighs in at 235 pounds. Perhaps the greatest wrestler in the world today. Kurt Angle has taken TNA by storm since arriving in 2006. Kurt Angle became the first ever TNA World Heavyweight Champion at TNA Slammiversary in 2007. The only gold medalist in professional wrestling history. Angle is also a 12-time world champion and three-time NCAA All-American. Kurt Angle has held the TNA World Heavyweight Championship for nearly a year, and this is his fifth meeting against Samoa Joe. I tell you what, man, they knew how to present you in these packages. <laughs> yeah, they didn't spare any expense. They they always they always promoted me very well. Uh, I commend them on that. Did a real nice job there, and uh, you have that beautiful belt. The MMA style shorts, not the typical slinglet that we're used to seeing. And uh, and here you come, you're walking down. But let's get into a little bit of the backstory. We're going to talk through the matches. You guys watch it and kind of listen to us as we go through it. For those that are that are watching here on YouTube, but there you are, no shoes. You got the ankles all <laughs> taped up. How did how? For, let me just ask you off the bat. How was it doing all this barefoot? It was weird. It really was weird. Um, it's easy to hurt your feet, your toes. Uh, it felt like it didn't feel like a wrestling ring because a ring kind of gives when, uh, you know, it bounces a little bit. Uh, you have that cushion. But when your feet with your feet, you feel the wood. It's just wood. It's incredible. Mm. It, it's a, a different feeling. It's really hard on your feet. Well, let's get into it a little bit. We have some uh, updates kind of building the storyline with you and Samoa Joe. From the torch, Angle uh, puts on an MMA display in the six-sided TNA ring with various sparring partners as a build uh, to this match that we're watching now. He didn't wear boots, but instead had tape feet and hands and had his slinglet drop down to his waist at the start. Ephraim Sims was his first sparring opponent. He forced a tap out with an arm triangle side choke less than a minute in. Next in was John Davis. Today noted that MMA camps uh, that each fighter was training at, Angle forced a tap out with a heel hook. 
Uh, Frank Sizzo was in next. Angle made Sizzo tap out again with a guillotine. So they're just making, they're just, you know, again, making you look like a beast here. Corey Chavis was in last. Angle headbutts him on the opening handshake and then pounded away at his head with one stiff blow after another, with the ref stopping in to stop the fight. They showed Chavis bleeding on the mat, still knocked out. Kurt, talk about doing all those matches. That had to be a lot of fun. Was this part of your, damn, I wish I'd gone to MMA? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was uh, for just, uh, you know, 10 minutes, I was in my own MMA world. You know, I, right. I, felt like I was really doing it. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And I was really looking forward to this match just because of the, you know, the display I did with those three guys. It was awesome. Uh, the torch goes on. It says during the sparring routine, Mike Tenay plugged that Frank Trigg would be on Impact next week to talk about Joe's training. Trigg is a former MMA fighter who was moved into the broadcasting side of the business. So, Kurt, do you remember how Frank Trigg uh, affiliation came to be? Was it because of the Spike relationship? Um, yes, yes. Uh, you know, Frank. Uh, I met Frank at a UFC event, and um, you know, he told me he was a big wrestling fan. And he also told me, hey, people are, are always mistaking me for you because they say I look like you. I said, Frank, you don't look like me. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. You don't look nearly as good as I do. You're not nearly as pretty. <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. So he told me, you know, he's a big wrestling fan. Uh, you know, he's a fan of mine. And uh, that's how it got started. And then the ball got rolling. I talked to Scott Fishman. We decided we're going to bring Frank Trigg over to do this match where they, uh, Frank Trigg would commentate for this. So you have a live impact special, which we talked about impact goes live. And, uh, this is also from the torch, a video package airs on Samoa Joe training for the angle match. He said, Kurt's trainers won't buy him heart or desire. Okay. It's not going to do that for you, Kurt. Uh, Marcus Davis, an MMA fighter compared watching Joe fight to watching Mike Tyson. Uh, he said he's fast and explosive and pulls out moves you wouldn't expect to see from him. Joe said it's never been Kurt versus Joe. It's been him against Kurt with backup like his wife or his cohorts. He said in the cage, nobody else is going to be in the ring. Davis said Joe is just an absolute animal who's going to go in for the kill. He said it will fit really well with the six sides of steel and he won't get out alive. Great delivery and tone from Joe and the entire video package. This is all from the torch. But uh, you got to be impressed with how Joe and how they're handling this whole side of it uh, against you, right? Yeah, Joe was great. Uh, you know, he really did train for this, uh, and he's so articulate with his words. You know, when he was doing promos and pre-tapes, he he is one of the best um, verbal guys in the business. Oh, yeah. He really is. He's so intense, and he he looks real, and everything he says, you can feel it. And I, I got to say, this is a really different side of Joe that I think, and you would, and I'm curious your opinion, it really helped take him to the next level, don't you think? Oh, it did. It did. It rose him three notches up. I mean, this this whole match and the way he went about it, the training and, and the, the interviews he did, this took him to a different level. You're right. Well, Mike Tenay interviews Joe live via satellite from Big Bear, California, Kurt. He asked how his training was going. Joe said it's probably been the most extreme thing he's ever been through. He said every day he gets closer to taking him out, and he promised a war on April 13th. Dude, 15 years ago, the war. Uh, Tanae pointed out Angle has won three of their four previous matches. Way to rub it in, Mike Tanae. Uh, and then he said uh, Angle will have to win by the sweat of his brow and what he does in the ring, not by being a snake behind the scenes. Tanae asked him about vowing to leave TNA if he loses. Joe said since he made that proclamation, he's regretted it because this is what he loves. He said, though, that if he can't beat the man and the best, it's not worth doing. He said he's going to take it by any means necessary, and at lockdown, he will win the world title. He got real intense at the end after being relatively low-key up until then. Man, just great stuff here, Kurt. Uh, were, were you were involved at all in producing any of these? Uh, these that, or just was this? No, him with no, listen, team? Joe did this all on his own. Wow. That, that's why this guy is so special. What he can do with a microphone, and not only that, what he could do in the ring. I mean, this guy is, you know, he has to be one of the top 10 best overall workers in the history of the business. He really is. His athleticism is off the charts. Promo skills are off the charts, too. He's incredible. 
I think when you look at, and you know, we get into a habit here on the show of top five, top 10, and, and there's different names <laughs> depending on the week. But I think when you look at how he's built and what he can do and, and the variety of what he can do, it's hard to argue. Uh, and I'm not going to say top whatever, but man, he's great. He is great at what he does. He absolutely is. And you know what? The cool thing about Joe is he's willing to try new stuff. I mean, he, he's always changed his repertoire. He, he never uses the same thing over and over again. He has so much, you know, so many different moves, so many different styles he can work. He, he's just really versatile. And when we go back and watch this stuff together, Kurt, it just blows my mind how the WWE didn't try to tap into him earlier in his career. You know what? I they they pat they really they did pass on Joe. I mean, Joe they missed. Had the opportunity. Yeah. He could have been one of the best in the WWE. He should have been a consistent champion. Uh, this guy can carry a title. He can carry himself. He can actually carry a company. And I think Samoa Joe didn't get to the level he he was uh, expected to in WWE. You know who I think liked him? Triple H. I think Triple H was a big fan of Samoa Joe. When he was running NXT, Joe was the man in NXT. And you don't have you don't need to say anything. I'll say it. But I think Triple H really loved him. And when someone else is running things, maybe not so much. But again, that's Paul Bromwell, not Kurt Angle. We move on. Frank Trigg joins Mike Tanay and Don West at ringside on commentary for a live sparring session that you had with AJ and Tomko, Kurt. So we're going to go through this from the torch. Tomko talked about emulating himself after you, Kurt. And uh, he said he didn't win an Olympic gold medal and he didn't up, end up as good as you, but he had the same body type and tried to follow your lead. The sparring began with Angle versus Tomko. Angle connected with a punch to the face that sent Tomko backwards. Tomko then shot in. Angle reversed him into an arm triangle. Trigg said Angle is the type to learn something in practice and try it the next day in an actual match. Tomko may have blew hard, uh, blew up the hard way from Angle's first punch unless they went to the trouble to blade to sell that punch's impact. Angle held him down for the rest of the minute. Styles then entered the ring next with the Rick Steiner wrestling headgear and red singlet. Styles circled away from Angle to avoid being punched. Angle got frustrated. Styles mostly avoided Angle for the full minute, avoiding a takedown and ducking a punch. Tomko re-entered the ring for a second minute. They showed the gash above his right eye. Tomko shoots in. Angle clutched his neck, then released. Trigg said if Angle promises not to hurt them, that doesn't mean he won't bang them up. Tomko applied another overhead guillotine choke. They were in the ropes, so the ref forced a break. Tomko all, all, almost mounted Angle. And this just continues on. Trid, uh, the bird wrestling torch said Trigg was really good on commentary, which is no surprise. He is a personality tailor-made for pro wrestling. So again, what did you think about this with Tomko and, and Styles here? You having you having fun mixing it up with these guys? Yeah, they were my boys, man. They were part of my gang at the time. And uh yeah, you know what? AJ and Tomko did a phenomenal job, especially AJ. I you know what? I will tell you this. AJ could do something like this as well. He was a state champion wrestler and uh he knows how to grapple. Uh if, if I ever had to do another match, I would definitely do one with AJ. I got to ask, how do you feel the fans are reacting to this so far at this point? Are, do you feel like they're pretty receptive and into it? Yeah, you know what? They were watching. They weren't cheering a lot at this particular time, but they were watching. Uh, we had their attention. Uh, we knew that's how it was going to be. So we weren't expecting anything else different than that. As long as they're interested in the match and they were focused on it, we were cool. They get, did get a little rowdy at times, especially in some false finishes and some submissions. But for the most part, they watched. It was almost like a Japanese crowd, where the Japanese crowd is like so into the match, they're mesmerized, and they, they clap you know, a little bit, but they don't make a lot of noise. Well, we continue on with the storyline uh, from The Torch. After a Samoa Joe training video aired, Kurt Angle then stood mid-ring and declared that everyone knows Samoans are lying sons of bitches. <laughs> He said next week he wants Joe to sign a legal document that if he doesn't win, he'll walk away from the ring forever. Then we hear Scott Steiner sirens hit. He walks out with Rocka Khan. He told Angle that he's there to set him straight. He told him that after his match at lockdown, he's cashing in his world title shot. He said he won't cash in that night because that wouldn't be fair. So he's giving the winner one month to prepare and then he'll have to face him at sacrifice. Angle would offer a handshake. Steiner told him he wouldn't shake his hand. He predicted a Joe victory because of who he's been training with. 
So here we go. Now Scott Steiner enters this uh, angle, Kurt. Uh, was this the right time and place for this to already be introducing him? I mean, we haven't even gotten to you and Samoa Joe's fight yet. You know what? I think they were trying to set up for after me and Joe, and they wanted to set it up earlier. But um, it wasn't bad because when you think of Scott Steiner, you're talking about an All-American wrestler in, high, in college. And Scott's a badass. Everybody knows he can fight. So th this was actually a great timing for Scott to come in and uh, make his voice known and that he's going to go after the world title to the winner against the winner of either Samoa Joe or me. I thought it was good timing. The uh, There's a stipulation that then ends up being added to this match that we're watching right now, Kurt, between you two. And it is that Samoa Joe not only will walk away from TNA, but pro wrestling altogether if he cannot defeat you at lockdown. Is this too much in your opinion? Because it seems like a theme with TNA that they just continue to add on stipulations. I mean, <laughs> you know what? Uh, I will say this. Um, when you say that only if you're going to retire, you should say this because whether you win or lose, you're going to retire. But when you're not going to retire and you guarantee a win or either that, or they're going to quit. The fans know there's no way in hell he's going to just quit, you know? So right. um, when you say that, you're basically saying, I'm going to win. You know, you're telling the fans, I'm a for sure winner. I'm not crazy about that either. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I don't like it. I don't think it's needed. I think the the fact that there are you're already doing a completely different style is enough excitement. For the world title, you and Joe, it's MMA, it's taped ankles. You're already, you know, have this whole build. You got Frank Trigg involved. MMA stuff. Why do we need to throw in another layer? No, you're absolutely right. Definitely, Paul. I need a T-shirt that says "You're absolutely right," and it's going to be <laughs> Paul Brown. That's because Angle, so. you are, man. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we continue on. Borash approaches Kurt Angle backstage and told him that Joe was willing to sign his vow to quit. Angle said, saying it is one thing, but doing it's another. He said he's already beat Joe three out of four times. He said that if Joe beats him, it's going to be a fluke. Angle said Joe won't agree to quit when he only has 25% chance of winning. Oh, look, here, Kurt's doing Steiner math. I like it. <laughs> Angle asked Borash what was weighing in on his what was weighing on his mind. Borash asked if he's seen the videos that came in from California. He's a different guy, Kurt. He's like a man possessed. Borash said. Angle said in three or four weeks, he can't master what he spent his whole life learning. He said he isn't training with the best fighters because he's the best fighter. He said he'll make Joe tap out for the last time at lockdown. I like this interview, Kurt. This is a good one out of you. Um, were you, how significantly, or how much were your hands on the creative of all this? A lot, a okay. lot. I mean, uh, it, you know, I was working with the writers very closely and we were coming up with uh, concepts and ideas together. And same with Samoa Joe. He was really articulate, too. He was bringing some stuff to the table. So this was all of us working together as one. Well, Angle calls Joe out to sign a contract vowing to quit pro wrestling. If he loses, Samoa Joe signs it. And we're officially on. And uh, I got to ask, Kurt, how much are you looking forward to this match? Oh, man, this was the, this was the one match that I could, could get – I could be somebody else Yes, you know, for the first time being an MMA fighter, you know, a champion. Um, this, this was like, this has always been a dream of mine to be in MMA and to be in UFC or Bellator. Um, so uh, unfortunately I couldn't do it for health reasons, but uh, to be able to, you know, uh, you know, actually do a reenactment or an yeah, enactment, a style, you know, be able to do that style. It was a lot of fun for me. Here we go, directly from the torch. For 20 minutes on Sunday night, Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle put on a hybrid of a match that incorporated about 70% MMA-style techniques and 30% of the familiar pro wrestling high spots. It was a fascinating experience as a viewer to watch. As two experienced craftsmen in TNA, you're a craftsman, Kurt, <laughs> rose to the challenge to create a new type of worked pro wrestling match. It worked. It was a very good, perhaps a great TNA pay-per-view main event. The submission style holds were 90% more realistic than a typical pro wrestling match. With a few embellishments for the sake of telling their story dramatically, it was just so good. So is this what you, you know, forget that. What was it like putting this match together? Can you walk me, walk us, the audience through what it was like? Yeah, you know, it was, it was complicated. 
mean, you have to remember when you start out, you have to have your hands up. You have to, you know, be trying to strike each other. And, you know, you don't start a match like that. You usually start a match with a tie up and you wrestle. Now we're fighting and, you know, a knockout is going to happen. It could happen. So you're starting striking, punching, and then you break it down to some wrestling for a little bit. Then you get into submission holds. And then we added false finishes because it was a pro wrestling match still. But um, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of memorization. We didn't call a lot of this in the ring. Okay. We called, most of it we had to uh, memorize because we had to know exactly what we were doing. Was there anybody else besides you and Joe that were involved in putting this together? This this. No, just Joe and I. It really? Was I putting this together, yeah. So not even any kind of influence that had an MMA background. It was just the two of you that were very familiar with it. Not really. I think we asked Frank Trigg about a couple of submissions. Okay. But other than that, uh, it was us. Nice. So uh, the torch goes on to say there were still high spots, but they were fewer than usual. When they did happen, they meant more. And the ones Angle and Joe chose were selected for realism in addition to the ins- excitement factor. Usually high spots are chosen by wrestlers because they're dazzling to watch without much regard for any sense of realism. Ha, buddy, that, that's called wrestling in today's world. <laughs> high spots galore. But in this match, almost everything just felt more authentic and more realistic. Do you think uh, this sounds more like an assessment of pro wrestling now? I, I mean, I even said it as I was reading through that. Uh, as far as like, you know, high spots are chosen by wrestlers because they're dazzling to watch and they don't really have, you know, much impact outside of that. Do you feel like that's what we see a lot in today's wrestling, Kurt? Yeah, wrestling today has become more acrobatic. It's yeah. about doing high spots, diving, flips. Uh, you know, it, it's. It's a little different, and eventually wrestling will get back to you know being more. I think this style right here is the best style. You, for instance, Pancrase, yeah, uh, does it over in Japan. Uh, work shoots. I think this is the best style. And I think eventually down the line, it's going to be like this. It really is because you got MMA. It's so popular. Pro wrestling's popular too. When you intermingle both of them it becomes really special. And that's where I, you know, if they could figure out a way to balance it, right? So it's not so high spot heavy where you could get more of this feel along with some here and there. That's where you win, right? Definitely. I think the, you know, limiting your high spots and making it more wrestling, more MMA oriented, it's a lot better. Uh, The Torch goes on to say their match drew from the popular sport of MMA with UFC being the top uh, name brand most are familiar with. (laughs) This is so fun to read now that we know they're all one company, uh, (laughs) WWE and UFC. Almost any sports fan and any TNA fan has been exposed to one extent or another on cable or at a sports bar. Some variation of UFC on Spike, Pride on FSN, uh, WEC on Versus, or the IFL on various channels. It's out there, and it has redefined what a realistic fight between skilled athletes look like. WWE and TNA wrestlers have been slow to adapt. The top heel in the WWE right now, Randy Orton, still applies a lying down headlock in almost every match for about four about four minutes into the match. It's a move that's not used in UFC because it's technically ineffective and that a skilled MMA fighter knows how to escape from it. When Orton applies it in a WWE match, he's basically putting his opponent in a position to look completely incompetent compared to even the most entry-level MMA fighters. What do you say to that, Kurt? Do you think MMA's changed the business as far as how what wrestlers and how they work? Yeah, yeah, because you have to be more realistic, you know, uh, and the submissions have to look real, and you know it, that's that's tough. I mean, we, it's it's there's a thin line between it. You know, I understand. You know, pro wrestling wants to stay pro wrestling, and MMA is MMA. But you know, when you intermingle it and uh, you know bring it together, it's going to be a lot better of a product. I'm I'm with you. Um, I think that the, again, it provides the realism side of it. Like, oh, there's you know the people that come in to want to watch wrestling, they like to look at the moves and be like, oh, I could get out of that, or that doesn't look. Right. How do you just? Well, I'll that? give you an example. Go ahead. Why pro wrestling sometimes doesn't make sense. Let's just say uh, the the guy has a hold on you. You fight back. And you start punching him in the face, and you're punching him in the face, and you're both up and facing each other. And then you stop punching them and you run the other way to hit the ropes to get a momentum. You don't do that. You're punching the guy. You're beating the shit out of the guy. Continue to beat the shit out of him. Yeah, you don't run that's away. That makes sense. You don't run away from him. Yeah. And that's what happens in pro wrestling. And that's why 
a lot of times fans don't, they know it's not real because they take the realism away by doing things like that. Kurt, I got to ask when you and, and uh, Samoa Joe, not only you plan, but you execute this match and it's over. Do you guys think or talk about, well, Hey, we could have, we could have changed the business tonight in a small, in a small way or a big way. Did you guys think? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. We, you know what? We thought we were going to, we thought this match was so good that things were going to change, but they didn't. And uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but you know, I, I know pro wrestling has their own way, their own stigma, and uh, they probably don't want to, yeah, I really believe the fans would like to see it uh, different. I believe the fans would love to see work shoots uh, like they do in Pancreas, like this, for instance. Yes. Yeah. I'm with you. I think anything that makes us believe and makes us feel. Or believe. Like, that's right. Believability is huge. Uh, I'll go on here right now because they continue to say the challenge for TNA right now uh, is uh, just. They said that you're so gung ho about MMA. He's borderline obsessed with becoming a generation uh, too late to be involved at a top level in a sport that it would probably have been his calling if he had if it had been around ten years earlier. MMA was a struggling sport with no big money contracts and a shaky future when Angle signed with the WWF. Now Kurt believes he is uniquely qualified to use his skill set to bring MMA style realism to TNA rings. Samoa Joe is an ideal opponent because he too has a real realistic style and fans perceive him as a legitimately tough guy, not just a showman. Were you able to pull this off with anyone else? Do you think besides Samoa Joe? I mean, I, I feel just, like, yeah, maybe AJ styles. Um, I think AJ would have brought a little more pro wrestling to it. His high flying skills. So I think nobody was better for this than Samoa Joe. Samoa Joe is the best for this. Well, Kurt, the match just ended. Samoa Joe gets the big win. Let's listen in. Samoa Joe, a chance of this. You guys heard me earlier. I didn't think Samoa Joe really had any shot of beating Kurt Angle. Boy, did he prove me wrong. He deserves this belt. He got some, he almost was submitted for a fight of a time. He was outclassed in takedown. He stayed with his tactics. He stayed with his game plan, and he pulled it together. What and the belt presentation. Three. Belt presentation made by Joe's trainer, UFC fighter Marcus Davis. What a proud moment for the Samoan submission machine to hit that muscle buster and gain the three count and not only become TNA champion, but to keep his professional wrestling career alive. And there you see the post-match embrace with Marcus Davis. Ladies so there it is, a muscle buster, and he gets the big win. Joe celebrates with the belt as the music's playing. We see it here. Look at that big kick to the face, man. Yeah. Joe, Joe, you know what? That didn't even hurt. Joe, Joe's so incredible. His, his, uh, he just has um, a, a way to you know look real without it really hitting you. His kicks and punches are phenomenal. He uh, takes your head off, which is it's just incredible <laughs> to hear you say that as we watch these shots. I mean, shot after shot, kick after kick, Kurt, between him giving them and you selling, it's just so realistic. Big angle slam. They're doing the highlight package now of the match. You have him in the ankle lock here. He hugs his trainer at the end, trainer Davis, and he wins the you know belt. What? I'm not going to lie to you. The one thing we screwed up on, when he beat me and he was celebrating, they should have had trainers come in and get me. Oh, I yeah. just was laying there like dead. You know, uh, while Samoa Joe celebrated next to me, if we were thinking the right way, we would have had trainers come in and pull me up and, you know, take me to the back. But here I am. There you're on all <laughs> fours. Sorry, I did it. I'm by myself. <laughs> yep. Kurt, uh, how happy or excited were you with uh, about this match after it ended? Oh, I couldn't be happier. I, I thought this match, this was one of my favorite matches uh, because it was with Samoa Joe and, and being able to do a realistic MMA style match, that is what, you know, that, that's where I came from. That's, that's what I'm all about. I'm a wrestler. I'm an Olympic wrestler. I'm a grappler. That's what, you know, that, that's where I could bring out my amateur wrestling skills and, and also fighting skills. But um, that's more my cup of tea than pro wrestling. 